Okay, the first thing I want to do is introduce um, James Hannon, and he, um, I met him when he was 11 years old, and he came to our first club meeting. I wanted him to just come up briefly and speak, because we haven't seen each other in, what, 24 years? I'm not that old. <laughs> Okay, well, come on up. All righty. Hi. Um, yeah, as she said, I was brought to my first luncheon at 11 um, by my friend Helen Brown. Some of you may remember her. She was the double leg amputee who was in the wheelchair. She also helped uh, get the Nelson Eddy Drive thing up and going. So for, I know Linda remembers her, Sharon, a few of you may remember her. Um, anyway, I started my journey with the club at 11, um, not knowing what I was doing. And then all of a sudden I was like, well, some of these older celebrities are still alive, but none of them are coming out and saying anything. So back in the day, um, before my generation got a hold of it and, you know, the internet blew up, uh, you use the phone. So I just decided to call SAG and figure out what I could do there. So um, in that process, uh, we got Catherine Grayson to come to one of the luncheons in L.A., and she was super sweet and super nice and very. She was reserved in a sense to where like none of us bombarded her, but she didn't deny anything about Nelson and Jeanette. She was very as open as she was willing to be, um, but very quiet. She signed um, pictures for all of us of her when she was 14 and her and Nelson were sitting together and singing. Um, I got Betty White on the phone um, because she was, as all of you may have heard, she wanted to be Jeanette McDonald. That was her whole reason she got into show business after Naughty Marietta. She was like, I was Jeanette McDonald. And she told me that story on the phone and she actually had an animal charity every time we would do our June luncheon. And then we would do a holiday luncheon and she was just like, I have another animal charity. So if you guys don't know anything about Betty White, animals came first, people came second. So even though she loved Jeanette, it was still hard to get her to come out. So throughout that process, um, I talked to a few other celebrities trying to get them, Lena Horne, Mickey Rooney. Um, Mickey Rooney is an asshole, so. I'm um, just going to put that out there. Pardon my language, but he was not the nicest. He wanted $10,000 to show up and all that. So not the nicest person, but he was just like not having it. But some of the people I did get in touch with, they never denied that Nelson and Jeanette were a thing. They just were like, we are from the years where we could lose our contract if we expose certain things and stuff like that so with people like sharon who've done the work for a lot of us it was kind of nice that you know she has gotten people to open up to her throughout the years and that's kind of how i became invested in our little mac eddie group Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. so our first guest speaker um unfortunately could not be here today. She fell ill at the last, very last minute. When I say very last minute, um, thank God I had done a videotape with her in April. I went, um, her name is Blythe Kearney. Her grandmother was one of Jeanette's best friends um, from school. And she met Jeanette and Nelson when they came down for a private little vacation, the two of them, Jeanette and Nelson, together in the late 40s. And she got to meet them, and they took her to Sunken Gardens, which is a beautiful tourist, touristy kind of attraction in St. Pete. And she had time to meet with Jeanette other times and actually spoke to her about Nelson. What? So that's kind of interesting. Um, Katie Gardner had interviewed her when she first came into our group and said that she had um, sat on Jeanette's lap when she was a little girl. And so everybody was interested in her story. Katie spoke with her. And when I moved to Florida, I found out, you know, I was in touch with the whole Florida group. And it turned out she lived 16 miles away from, from me. So we got together for lunch. And later she agreed, said, you know, she would come to L.A. and speak here today. 
So what I did at the 11th hour was sat down and took a three hour videotaped interview and pulled out about 40 minutes of it to show you today, which is what she would have discussed. My name is Blythe Kearney and the date is April 26th, 2023. And I am going to talk about Miss Jeanette. The reason I call her Miss Jeanette was my grandmother was absolutely adamant about it. Uh, she was a lady, she was older than me, and so she was Miss Jeanette. And I still, even at my age of 80, call her Miss Jeanette. I first met Miss Jeanette when I was about three, four years old. And she came down to Florida to visit grandmother. She went to school with grandmother. She went to school with her. Oh, high school, and um, they knew each other rather well, and uh, so she came down to visit, and I'd love to tell you what they talked about, but they never talked about anything really important in front of me, because I was a child, and, but anyway, it was, uh, uh, she, she was really sweet with me, and the first time she saw me when she came in, she said, hello, sweetheart. And then after that, every time she would come to see Grandmother and I was there, she would sing Sweetheart. So I think about her when I watch the movie Sweetheart and uh, remember her beautiful, beautiful voice. My first impression of her was she was beautiful. Children know beauty when they see it. And uh, she would put me on her lap and she would talk to me and I would talk to her. and smell good. I have no idea to this day what the perfume was she wore, but it was fantastic. Um, it was like being a grandmother's garden and uh, had all those, those flowers and those wonderful, wonderful scents. Um, she would talk to grandmother about not very much and holding me and patting me on the shoulder and it was and she was just soft and pretty and really nice and had the sweetest voice talking voice, not just singing voice. And she came down about four or five times, and then she came down one time, and she brought a gentleman with her. And he was very nice too. And uh, she didn't introduce me except that she called him Nelson. And so I had to call him Mr. Nelson. Um, and he talked to me, and he had me on his lap, and, and he would tell me all these lovely things that men generally tell grown-up women. And some of the things he would say to Miss Jeanette were really kind of nice too. So they both were talking and we had a, have a big place here in St. Petersburg called Sunken Gardens. And it's a huge garden full of all kinds of Florida flowers and, and trees and things like that. So I had was talking about it when Miss Jeanette mentioned something about flowers. And so they wanted to see it. So they got the directions from Grandmother and down we went. All of us, the three of us, not Grandmother, just Mr. Nelson and Miss Jeanette and me. Well, it was gorgeous, it was gorgeous. And of course, like anything in Florida, there were orange trees and, and Mr. Jean picked me up and held me up so I could get an orange and, uh, I said something to the effect about the, the, the man here might get mad and he said, oh, he said, I have some influence. And uh, so then we continued walking in the garden, holding hands. Uh, I was in between them and they'd lift me up and it was just a joyful, wonderful afternoon. And they were very close, both in, in, in there and, and just talking to each other. You knew they were close. So I ran on ahead and when I turned back to say something, we're standing there holding hands and he had his arm around her waist and they were watching me so that I wouldn't get hurt. So back we went to grandmother's house and they went off. I never saw him again. Uh, it was not a matter of, they just didn't come down together. But I would see her off and on. And uh, grandmother was telling me uh, that Miss Jeanette had gotten married and I thought she had gotten married to Mr. Nelson, but apparently not. And, uh, but she went to the wedding. Grandmother and grandfather went to the wedding. 
So I asked later on when I was older, I asked what he was like, and she said, he's weird. Dresses were concerned. She grew up with a typical woman. But she was telling me that she didn't like the wedding per se. She didn't think the wedding was a happy wedding. Uh, some of the people uh, that uh, Miss Buck Jones and, and a few of the other ladies, uh, Helen, he, uh, liked them. But Miss Jeanette was not crabby, but she, he said, wouldn't take much to have made her crabby. Now, why would you be crabby during a wedding? But um, then they went off to to their um, to their various uh, whatever's had to be done, and uh, it was I guess about a month or two later, Miss Jeanette visited grandmother again. Now I was not invited to that one because I have a feeling now, in retrospect, that there were some problems that I didn't need to hear about. I mean, I was a child. Yeah. Um, but basically, that then we did see Miss Jeanette for a while, and uh, I was uh, in Pennsylvania, uh, and I was going to a play, and it turned out if she was in the play, well, not play, not a play, I'm sorry, in, in, in a, a musical, and so I thought I took a chance and went backstage and she was talking to a lot of people and she turned around and said, Blythe, and gave me a big hug, held my hand the entire time she made rounds with people. Uh, I'm sure famous people were there, but I don't know. And then we went out to dinner and that unfortunately was the last time I saw her. Uh, now, she died not too horribly long after that, and grandmother and grandfather went to her funeral, and grandmother was very, very angry about Jean, did not like the way he treated the whole attitude, the whole atmosphere, and had his friends there, and uh, his weird friends, and um, that was the last time grandmother saw her, him, and actually, grandmother only saw him twice at the wedding and at the funeral. That's unique. Wow. But um, then she came back to Florida, and I decided I wanted to talk about Miss Jeanette. So she wasn't going to tell me a whole lot. And, and, and grandmother was not the kind of person that you talk to if you wanted dirt on somebody, especially somebody she loved. But we sat down and, and we talked and she was telling me that how active Miss Jeanette was in school and uh, how fun she was. She, always, she was always fun and uh, laughed and got a lot out of life as, as a teenager. And then she went off to Hollywood and uh, she and grandmother stayed in touch. And then of course she got engaged and that was not well, grandmother said, I, I don't stick my nose into other people's business. No, she didn't, just mine. And, uh, but she, you know, was talking about Miss Jeanette had a lot of boyfriends, a lot of guys that liked her. And she get, get understood that there was something between she and her co-star, and not Raymond Navarro, uh, Nelson. You mean Jenny? Huh? You mean Jean? Jean? No, no, it was nice, it said between she and her, her, uh, yeah, between she and her co-star, but yeah. not Raymond Navarro, because he was well known as her co-star. Between she and Jean, oh, I, oh, oh. grandmother, right. never met, mentioned him until the weird remark came up. Oh, wait she, a minute, are you talking about Chevalier? Or no, no, or, uh, Ramon. Um, From the Cat and the Fiddle? Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. got it, got yeah, it. Because everybody kind of liked, you know, she didn't like, she didn't like Mr. Chevalier at all. Uh, but grandmother said, because he was just kind of pushy and thought he was better than all the younger people. Okay. And she was in some, my grandmother said she was in some movies that grandmother didn't like, not because they were terrible, but because the acting and directing was terrible. But then she, then she went into Naughty Marietta, and she, grandmother had never heard of Nelson Eddy, um, but then grandmother didn't do opera. And so anyway, you know, she went to the movie and she said it was wonderful. 
She said it was absolutely wonderful. And those two people had a chemistry that was just hard to beat, and it never went away. So grandmother said she could not wait to ask Miss Jeanette what was going on there. And uh, Miss Jeanette denied anything was. Well, this is like the first movie they do yeah. together. And uh, so grandmother kept writing to her saying, how's it going? How's it going? <laughs> and, and finally, apparently, uh, she had a, a big confidential conversation with grandmother, which I don't know exactly what was said, but I kind of got an idea. I mean, I wasn't three years old anymore. And uh, then when mother would talk to Miss Janet on the phone or, or get a letter from her, you know, she would always then constant. She would be saying, "Well, she's going to do another movie, and and Mr. Jean's going to be in it, and and his name cropped up more after the phone calls and the letters than they, you know, than before." So you know, this kid is like, "I know what's going on," and so I said to grandmother, "I said they care, don't they? They love each other, don't they?" And grandmother said. I'm not going to say yes or no, but you're not going to say anything to anybody you know. That's their life, <laughs> not ours. And I, you know, Grandmother was rather intimidating, so I agreed to that. And, um, but there were, there were a lot of things that uh, I shared with her as a child. And probably I got a better idea of what she was like than most adults. Because she didn't put on a, a mask for me. She talked to me. She sang to me. Uh, she'd say silly things to me. And uh, she'd even sit down once on the floor and play dolls with me. Wow. And, I, and uh, But she, she would take me out when she'd come to visit grandmother. She would take me out for a walk. And uh, one time we uh, went for a walk and, uh, and we had... Banyan trees. I don't know if anybody's ever seen a banyan tree, but they're humongous. And we used to go there, and the then the uh, roots stretched out, and, and then we'd sit in between the roots and we'd talk, you know. And I thought later on, I thought talking to a four-year-old or three or four-year-old or whatever the year was that we did must have been very difficult you know you can't you can't certain things you just can't talk about and then some things you know kind of stretch your imagination but we did we did and I don't remember ever feeling uncomfortable with her uh, I never and I also never felt like a baby with her. she never talked to me baby talk yeah thank God and um, I'm not sure I'd be as happy to remember her if she did um, she would come to grandmother's, and one time she spent the night, and uh, so I slept in the other bed. And, and I, I want to sleep in here. I want to. I can remember saying that. Grandmother said, "If if it's okay with Miss Jeanette, Miss Jeanette said yes, and she told me a story, and then she and grandmother went out, and I was happy. Um, she made me a large part of her life in my grandmother's house." Uh, I was not ignored. I was, uh, I was occasionally sent outside when they were talking about who knows what, but something I should not hear. But I was never sent away. She never was impatient with me. Uh, she asked grandmother the first time if, if uh, she thought I should go in the other room, and, and Miss Jeanette said, no, don't ever send her into the other room when I'm here. In other words, you know, she wanted me there. She liked me there and did not want me to feel rejected. So that was fine, and except occasionally I was asked to go outside, but that didn't bother me. If I'd been sent in the bedroom, it would have bothered me. Yeah. So, yeah, and then we'd go for walks, and the three of us, uh, grandmother and Miss Jeanette and myself, and we lived not too far from a grocery store, or I guess they call them bodegas now, and... Uh, we would go there, and uh, I would, of course, we bought some candy, and uh, grandmother would mutter something about my being spoiled, and and it was just, it was wonderful. I wish I could share it with you. She was just amazing. She was gorgeous, um, and uh, 
and she would and she would also change clothes when she got to ground with this and she wore a pair of slacks and a, and, and a sweater if it's cool in Florida which it does get one or two days and then um, you know we would we would go out we'd go to the beach and uh, I liked that uh, so we would go there and all of us would splash around grandfather went with this too occasionally um, mom and dad would go sometimes on the weekend because they worked and uh, that was that was okay they they were glad I had was with somebody who could who could uh, contribute to to growing up things like music and acting and and uh, the music that of course missed all beautiful music it wasn't thank god rock um, and her clothes were beautiful <laughs> she just had the most gorgeous clothes oh lord of mercy and uh one time she brought a dress that she wore she said she wore it in sweethearts and it was a, a long flowing dress with a scarf around it that flowed out behind her and she had and I remember it now when I think about it. It was pink and uh, she was telling me that she had, had sung with Mr. Uh, Nelson and then I saw the movie and remembered the dress. She's given me a lot of memories, great, great memories. I never saw her angry. I never saw her impatient. She probably was a tad angry when she talked to my grandmother, but not not at grandmother, but about what she was talking about. But when I think back on it, when I think about how she kept her private life private from a child, and there's nothing I can say about Miss Jeanette that doesn't paint the picture of a beautiful, moral, kind, child-loving woman. I have since learned that she has had abortion or miscarriages and was unable to carry a child. And it makes me sad simply because I know how she would have been for the child. And I wasn't her child, so, and she was so wonderful with me. How would she have been with her own kid? Probably. And uh, I think life would have been different for her too if she would have carried one of those children. I think then life would have changed. I think she would have changed her life and I don't think that the man standing at her funeral would have been Mr. Raymond. Uh, so, but the man standing beside her was Mr. Nelson. Uh, even though he was not her husband in reality. I always thought he was. You know, it took me a while to figure out that he wasn't married to her because when I did see them together, he was so kind and she was so gentle back to him. You know, I always thought that's the way married people should act. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I guess maybe subconsciously they were. That, uh, uh, yeah. but there's remember when she died too it uh my grandmother called me and uh, said i'm going out to california uh to a funeral and i said oh who is it she said miss jeanette and oh god oh my god <laughs> oh boy mm, that was not um but she said the thing that bothered her the most at that funeral was the fact that uh, Nelson brought his mother and his wife. His mother? No. His mother wasn't alive then. Oh. I think... I think grandmother thought his wife was his mother. <laughs> <laughs> and she... It, that was that was fun, and uh, whenever Miss Jeanette came, she usually brought me something. So, and that wasn't always big. It might have been a box of chocolates, a small box of chocolates, or a little. Oh, she brought me a little bottle of perfume one time, and I thought I had died and gone to heaven. And I said, "Is this your perfume?" And she said, "No, it's not my perfume. <laughs> <laughs> That's too old for you." Oh wow! Yeah. 
Yeah. Oh, and then when, and Grandma took me to see their movies when when I was alive, and they would they did a lot of, and they did this with uh, the what you call it the uh, Wizard of Oz too. They would reboot them. They would okay. bring back a few years later. So uh, when they did Rosemary, um, she took me, and I had to ask Miss Jeanette how she liked horseback riding and, and all this, so we went through the horseback riding thing, and uh, she said that, that uh, Mr. Nelson always teased her because she wasn't as good at it as he was. <laughs> she said, I was. <laughs> Did she tell you any other anecdotes from the films? Uh, yeah, there was a, there was a couple. Um, there the one uh, where, and it was Rosemary, where he was sitting down there singing to her. Uh, he they had to do the take four times because he kept sitting back and falling, you know. And he did, <laughs> and she said there was one scene where they re they reran it, and there he, it was two feet sticking up. <laughs> the, the thing, and uh, and then oh, the uh, number in the saloon, yeah. and they kept telling her to to loosen it up when she was doing the dance because was it Gilda Gray? Yeah, yeah. Gilda Gray really could do the shimmy, and uh, she said, you know, she was out there, and and Nelson was yelling. Shake it up, shake it up. And she said, when they stopped, I shook it up. <laughs> I thought, oh, is that on film? <laughs> oh, wow. Did she tell you any anecdotes from any of the other films? Uh, yeah. she One of the ones that she liked the most to do, it just about, it was Maytime. Yeah. And uh, she said, your grandmother, or your grandmother, told me that I was in the movie with her cousin. That's uh, John Barrymore. Oh yeah. And I said, oh, <laughs> I thought that's her cousin. <laughs> and, and grandmother told me, but um, she enjoyed that movie because it gave her a range to sing that she normally didn't have. Yeah. Uh, I mean, she had great range, and she sang some really good operas. But that one, she kind of like well, all the a lot of scenes, not just that one number, uh, gave her a chance to to use her range, vocal range, yeah. and uh, also in Rosemary, uh, she liked that first song that they sang um, about the lady. Oh, right, right, right. And when she's in the... In the house and, and she's and got all the... The flowers and yeah. she throws out the windows. Right. Yeah, 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 that one. Right. Right. And, uh, mm -hmm. but... Pardon me, madame. Yes. Yeah. I like that song, yeah, too. Yeah, great. I do. She liked that song? Oh, yeah. Yeah. She said it was, it was... There was a lot... She said, I had an image that Hollywood created for me. And she said, and the way I was in the movies. Now, this stuff she told me later on when we had dinner that night when I was older. I mean, it wasn't, but she said, um, she said, I, I liked that song because she said I could be perky and flirty and uh, stuff that I'm not supposed to be. And she said, except in, in period. And she liked the period ones because she loved the uh, costumes. But what was the one that I was trying to remember, is it? Yeah, it was, um, what was the first one they made together? Naughty Marietta. Naughty, thank you. Yeah, yeah. This is old people. Yeah. Uh, in Naughty Marietta, she, it was her first real period. She's had, you know, like empire and stuff like that. And they put her in it. She said, she wanted to move, and she said she couldn't move because they had tightened her waist to the point where she couldn't even breathe. She said, but I, I, you know, she has to do this. This is a new chance. And she took three steps and fell. <laughs> and she said, I'm laying there with all the gowns spread out around me. And she said, I didn't know what to say. And she said, the director came over and said, 
Give me your hand, gal. <laughs> she yanked her up. <laughs> but, uh, um, and then she, she'd talk about how she'd be sitting in a chair and she'd be thirsty. And, and it was like Nelson read her mind. That he brought her whatever, coffee, uh, water, or whatever. And then they'd all sit around and they'd all talk. And uh, it sounded it sounded real, real great. I said, you weren't temperamental? She said, me? I said, bull Frankie. <laughs> and I didn't say that, but... Uh, <laughs> Of course she was. She was a diva. Did <laughs> she say anything about Woody, the director, um, San Francisco? About him? Yeah. Any comments about Not him? really. No. Maybe she didn't think I'd care. Mm -hmm. What about the film? What about, did you say anything about Girl of the Golden West? Oh. Yeah. What about oh. Sweet? Sweethearts, did she say anything about that? Or? Other than singing the song? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, she said she, she understood when they broke up and they were going off in different directions. She said, I really could understand why my character was so disappointed with her new leading man. Because she said, I can't sing anymore with a new leading man. And, and uh, yeah, I can, I can see that. And it, it did look uncomfortable, and he looked uncomfortable with the girl. And uh, as a matter of fact, I did think that was funny later or before when the guy said, we'll never get to, <laughs> to just on this. But uh, who, who was the father? You mean, she uh, Frank Morgan? Yeah, she yeah. loved him. Yeah. He was in many, many of their the movies, movie. and she thought he would, she, she said, he was his, her favorite leading man. <laughs> said, Frank Morgan? Yes, because <laughs> he was in everything, practically, <laughs> she was in. And uh, I liked him, too. I, and, of course, he oh, was yeah. he was the wizard. Yeah. Yeah. Did she have any particular stories, or just... No, just the fact that uh, um, he would get her coffee, he would take her, and and every so often she'd say, I need a drink. And he'd take her out to take, <laughs> down, the, down the street to have a drink. And they were like real close friends. And uh, she, uh, and, and uh, Nelson got a little perturbed because when they had a, they had a disagreement. It wasn't an argument. They disagreed on a subject. And and he said, she said, he looked at Frank and he said, don't you agree? And Frank said, I never agree with you when you're arguing with her. <laughs> if she made any other comments about her film directors. She really didn't make comments about them except for the fact that there were certain movies that she felt comfortable doing and that she enjoyed uh, she enjoyed Woody and uh, he always made her feel comfortable although he could be a very tough director uh, but he was a kind man and uh, he brought out the best in she and Nelson um, when he asked them to do something they delighted in doing it he never lost his temper and uh, you know, the other director was okay, too, but uh, they, this was somebody that they were fond of who was very good at what he did. And when, I guess in the movies, when you're very, very good at what you do, then the stars do what you tell them. They do, do it because they know the best in them is coming out. And he was a friend. She said that he was a friend. She And then, you know, and she would say, I tell her, she, I, you know, you're always happy around me. And he's, she said, I said, must be nice to be always happy. And she said, I'm not always happy. Understand when you see people up on the screen that you like and they're laughing and they're not happy. And she's always, she said, they have personal lives. They have pain in their personal lives. They have things that don't go right. They have things that will never go right. And that's when it dawned on me later on when I had a chance what she was saying when she said, they never go right. Hers did not go right. And uh, I thought she dealt well. 
with what she went through from things I've seen her in her in the movie. And when I, I, I only saw her twice as an adult when I was an adult, well, teenagers aren't adults, but back then we were more so. Uh, much of what I picked up from her, I picked up as a, a 16, 17 year old. Uh, and things that I remember her saying when I was a kid, you know, little funny things, turned out not to be so funny. And, um, and I do remember the looks she and Mr. Nelson gave each other. That I remember. I look and I think, oh. <laughs> you know, I was a little kid. And uh, because my mommy and daddy looked at each other like that. And I couldn't figure that one out. But then I stopped trying to figure it out. You only do that so often when you're a child. Do you, do you know where they stayed when they came together that time? Oh, down here? Yeah. God, I don't know if it's still standing. The hotel in St. Pete. Oh, the Princess Martha. Princess Martha. It's now an apartment Beautiful apartment complex. I'd love to live there, but good Lord of mercy. Um, yeah, that's where they stayed. It was a, it's a, it was a beautiful hotel back then. It is a beautiful uh, apartment complex now, so. Oh. And and after, um, after going to Sunken Gardens, did you all go out to dinner? Did you have dinner at the house or? No, we work? we went out and we had hamburgers and French fries, because mom, my grandmother and grandfather were going out to a friend's house that uh, that Mister Net didn't know, and you know you. Um, I think she may have met them later on, but so they asked, he asked me, what do you want to eat? You know, because they, I said, hamburger, hamburger, fries. So they took me to a hamburger and fries place. Uh, <laughs> I thought how romantic is that? I know. <laughs> what, do you remember what it was called or? Where? No, it's not there anymore. It was a private, um private, at, well, it wasn't a McDonald's or, because they didn't really have those back then. Yeah. Um, but, uh, they, but we had a Briar's ice cream. They took me there afterwards, the Briar's. Oh. Briar's, well, Briar's is old. Yeah. And they had one of those. And Do you know what year this was? After the war. It must have been one, two, probably 47. I was born in 42, so that would be about 47 of us, 40, 46 or 47. My dad had just gotten home, and that was one of the reasons I was with grandmother so much. You know, it's not that daddy didn't want to see me, but he and mom, we needed to spend some time together, and by golly, it wasn't too much late longer that Susan was born. <laughs> oh, I get it. <laughs> I mean, he'd been gone for three, four years. Yeah. And, uh, uh, so they'd already been there a few days when you... A couple of days, yeah. Yeah. And then I think they were there afterwards, too. But yeah, because Grandmother told them afterward how to get to the beaches. Although then... They could go downtown because Spa Beach, and 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 was and it was a beautiful place. Think about it. Um, it was a beautiful beach back then. It wasn't grungy and grubby like I think it is now. Although, they, but uh, and that was a nice place to go. Now whether or not they might have been recognized there. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Were well, you? Did was it ever discussed like your grandmother discussed or anything that Jeanette was pregnant while they were making sweethearts? She never told me, but I I was an OB nurse and I was watching the movie one night and I could tell just by to begin with looking at her face. Her face was rounder than usual. And uh, she didn't move, but not, I was going to say as graceful. She didn't bounce around. Yeah. Um, 
So I thought, assumed that perhaps she was pregnant. I do know that she had had miscarriages, but grandmother never told me by who. <laughs> she wasn't going to do that. Um, but yeah, I and I knew that. I looked at her and I thought, okay. <laughs> talked about both her sisters, but she mostly talked about Blossom. What did she say about Blossom? About, about, uh, <laughs> how funny she was. What a card. My sister is a card, she said. But, um, about how Blossom was her rock. That, you know, she and Elsie were not that close. Elsie was the oldest? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, they weren't that close. And, and Jeanette was the baby. Yeah. And so you had Blossom in the middle. And I don't imagine uh, that. Have you ever seen Elsie? Yes. Okay, I've seen pictures of her, and she does not look like the warmest person in the world. Right. And uh, But Miss Jeanette never spoke about her. So, or, or just that she had a sister, Elsie. Um, but she, she, yeah, uh, Blossom was her rock. And when things were, wouldn't be really good, it was Blossom who, who gave her that extra kick. She said, that extra kick in the bottom to get me going and pop me out of it. So uh, I gather, and I never, like I say, I am assuming that when I was in Philadelphia that time, Blossom was in Hollywood. Uh, but the other one, no. Grandmother knew her, and she didn't know her really well because she was older than Jeanette and but she I when I asked grandmother about uh Elsie she said, she talk at all about her concert career or how she liked she enjoyed music. concert uh, because she could break in between it and you know she'd go out and have a uh, a concert and uh go back and sit down and relax and uh, she said that then and you'd have all day to relax you wouldn't have to and then you'd go out and you'd do the concert she's the concerts were not long i there were not weeks of concerts and so you know it was and she was getting older too and the heart and uh so and i asked her how did your husband like traveling? And she said, I don't know, he never did. <laughs> so, did she say anything else ever about Jean? Interesting. But, you know, she didn't have to, because when she'd talk about Nelson, you knew. I mean, if you were a woman, you know. If you were a man, you probably wouldn't have known. But uh, yeah, he, it, it got, she got soft. She got whispery sometimes, not hiding anything, just whispery. And or I, I, I did that that when I how, how's Nelson? <laughs> how's Mister Nelson? Sorry, and uh, and and she'd go on. She'd tell me. What did you, what would she say? Oh, he he's busy and he has a new partner. I said, do you like the new partner? She's okay. <laughs> I said, what color hair does she have? She's a blonde. <laughs> I said, well, he's got to do something, honey. <laughs> it goes and after dinner. You guys went back to the hotel. Did you take a cab or walk? No, we walked. It wasn't too far. Um, and we we went back to, to her hotel room because we had a lot to discuss and catch up with. And they weren't going to let us sit for hours and hours and hours at the table at Delmonico's. I mean, there were people waiting. And uh, so we went back to the hotel, nice hotel, and sat around and uh, just talked about things we had done and things we were going to do and uh, we talked about Gene and he was never Mr. Gene and um, what did she did she say anything she else? did you know I, I said to her I said I know that you 
and M Mr. Nelson care about each other deeply. And, uh, but how does Mr. or how does Jean take that? And she said, well, she said, it's not easy. She said, one minute he doesn't care and one minute he's angry. But she said, and then there are times when he's very nice to me. And she said, we get along very well. And we go out to dinner, we go out to a club, uh, to a party. And she said, and then things change. And she said, it's just, it's a yo-yo. And uh, she didn't discuss their, his personal life. Just that he went out with friends a lot. And so did she, but not in the same manner. And uh, but she didn't have much to say about him. You know, it's not like I have a lot of married friends and all they can do is talk about their husbands and how wonderful they are. And, and you know, Johnny fixed me dinner the other night. I thought that was wonderful, the idea of Jean fixing Miss Jeanette dinner just escapes me. I can't wrap my mind around that. <laughs> But uh, I, I just never got any warmth at all, although she was respectful all the time. Uh, I don't know if he was or not, because except I, I never met him, never met him, and didn't want to, but I never did. And, but she talked a lot about him. She talked about, you know, about what they did and what they were doing and, their dogs and their ranch, or not ranch, their house out in the country, and just things. She talked about things, and it was very interesting, her life, and then what she was going to do. She was contemplating doing something, but she didn't know what, because she got tired very easily. And um, I can't imagine N Miss Nanette, uh, Miss Nanette, Miss Jeanette, uh, flaunting her affair. Um, I know that there were a couple men in her past, um, and that's fine. She was a kid. She was young. And then she fell in love, deeply in love, and made a mess of her life. Yeah. And uh, the only, you know, I mean, she made a mess of her life. Nobody else did. Yeah. And, and, and for that, I feel so deeply sorry for her. Yeah. Um, don't judge her. I mean, that just had to happen. Yeah. And nobody should. Because she just fell in love with a man. Not every man. She didn't fall in love with every man. Mm -hmm. um, and she may have loved other men, but not been in, in love with them. It's a difference. Yes, absolutely. Um, and like Mr. Morgan, she loved him, but she wasn't in love with him. Yeah. And uh, but she was in love with one man, and unfortunately, she didn't know how to solve her problem. Yeah. Did she say anything else you remember that sort of alluded to just you know like her giving you advice or 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 just something that reflected? what you know she'd gone through herself. Yeah, when we would discuss my, my future, you know, the only thing that she told me is, if you fall in love with a man, go after him, grab him, and hold on to him. And she said, and that's all I can tell you about love. And all the things she didn't do. And, uh, and I don't know why she didn't do it. I, I, I don't know whether it was a weakness or what, because we really didn't discuss those that too deeply. But I, I just, I'm not sure. But uh, I, don't, I don't know why she didn't take her own advice. Yeah. You know, go, you know, go up to his wife and backhand her and go up to her husband and backhand him and then grab Nelson and go off. Um, that's, that's sad. Did she ever talk about mistakes, like, like making mistakes in life? Yeah, she said she'd made a lot of mistakes. 
but haven't we all? If you yeah. think about it, you know. And, and she said some of the mistakes that she made weren't really mistakes, but they were just things that happened when she was younger. And she said, but there were other mistakes that were life altering. And uh, okay, I can believe that. And what what did you say to that? Well, I just listened or what? I listened to what she had to say, and and I I told her too. This was something that hit me at the time. I said, I think, Miss Jeanette, one of your problems is that you are a beautiful, popular movie star, and everybody tells you what you want to hear. And she said, well, you don't. <laughs> I said, no, I don't. I said, you know how I feel. You're, you're, you're my buddy. But um, no. I said, people, pe people can't constantly be agreed with and not think that everything they want, they can have. You thought everything you wanted, you could have, and that didn't happen. And that was the first time she knew I knew. Oh. Really knew, knew. I mean, I knew about Nelson, but, the, but the, you know, what does a four or five year old know about two people holding hands in sunken gardens? Not much, but... What did she say to that? Or did she, how did she react? Nothing. She just looked at me. If you have any questions, she'll answer a question or two and then we'll take our break and get on. Hi. Hi, we just finished watching the video and I just wanted to see if anybody had any questions for you. I'm going to put you on speakerphone, okay? Okay. Okay, so we just want to thank Blythe for um, the, uh, they loved it. So anyway, does anyone have any questions for her? Yes. How old were you when you met Jeanette? You first met her. Three. Three. Okay. Another question. And you were what, in your late teens or mid to late teens the last time you saw her? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm getting away from a television that's on. <laughs> okay. You were in your, you were in your mid, 16 or 17 the last time you saw her, right? Correct. Okay. At a play in Philadelphia. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Just thank you. <laughs> Welcome, and I wish I could be there with you guys. Well, you're with us in spirit, and we're, we're so glad that we somehow managed to share the afternoon with you. Okay? Well, thank you. Take care, and I'll thank give you care. a buzz later, okay? Enjoy it all. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Now it's time to welcome four people who are making their first visit to a yearly Mac Eddy birthday event. Their connections to Nelson and Jeanette are, to put it mildly, amazing. I got to know one of them, Ann Kessner, this lady right here. <laughs> Remotely over the past year when she contacted me while trying to buy a copy of the most recent edition of Sweethearts. We met in person for the first time just this week. Although she never met them, Anne has a fascinating number of connections to Nelson and Jeanette. By coming here today, she is truly, quote, coming home. We didn't know it at the time, but Anne and I were neighbors for many years, living just blocks apart in Toluca Lake, just down the street, actually. We both studied cinema in college, Anne at USC and I at UCLA. When she saw my picture, Anne kept saying, I know you from somewhere. <laughs> Turned out it wasn't college or work, but at the grocery store, bakery, and dry cleaners, just a couple of blocks from where we are today. Anne lived in Southern California for 27 years, working both in front of and behind the scenes in broadcast news at all three major networks, as well as RKO, Metro Media, as well as the Tribune and Journal companies. She spent 12 years at NBC in New York and just down the street from here at 3000 West Alameda. Now I invite Anne to tell her story and to introduce three of her closest friends and share their stories with us. 
Now, I want to say just one thing that when she's all done, when everybody's all done, I want to say something to sort of bring it all together a bit. So anyway, let's welcome Anne. Thank you. Well, first of all, I'm so glad to be with all of you. And as I have said to the friends I have brought here who are coming for the first time over and over every day, that I just wish I could be around all of you all the time because you're the kind of people I like. We're all smart as can be. <laughs> we have common interests and you're so darn nice. And I am just grateful to be part of this. And this is my first time here. I joined Mac Eddy online as well as a couple of the other safe groups. And I am so uh, impressed by Sharon's work over all these years. Her writing is wonderful. And I've been a writer and editor forever since they started with tablets. I think Moses did it or something. I go way back. <laughs> and uh, she has done such a great job with writing and research and now the film. <laughs> She is truly, I feel, a kindred spirit. We have the same sense of humor, and we're truly valley girls. <laughs> so let me start by introducing the three people I have brought here. Uh, first of all, I'd like you to stand, Sandy Line. Uh, we met decades ago here in the valley when we were the only women in a private pilot ground school in all of Los Angeles. I don't think we wanted to be astronauts. We just wanted to fly little Cessnas. Uh, during a coffee break, we discovered that we grew up about 19 miles apart on the same lake in Wisconsin. Strange things happen here. <laughs> uh, Sandy is a retired Los Angeles public school history and social sciences teacher and current field supervisor for Occidental College student teachers. Pepperdine, I'm sorry, and a docent at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. Uh, she's traveled all over the world and has taken a break this week to join us at Smokehouse. Next, now many of you have gotten to talk with this wonderful lady, who's another of my super pals. She's been here and, and uh, has signed her books for you, and uh, you've learned about her and her family. Cheryl, Cheryl Rogers Barnett. Cheryl is the author of three books and the oldest daughter of Western stars, Roy Rogers and Dale Evans. She and I, who are longtime friends, are currently writing a book about her mother titled The Dale We Knew. And we just found out yesterday uh, there are people who want us to do a film on Dale. Not a documentary, but a film with actors and actresses. You know, a horse named Trigger or something, you know. Um, Cheryl's parents had the same personal manager as Nelson Eddy and knew Jeanette and Nelson well. Uh, over the years, Cheryl worked at a congressman's office out here, was employed by the entertainment division of a major California bank, served as executive secretary to the head of a major Dutch shipping company in Connecticut, and at the request of her dad, managed the Roy Rogers Museum in Victorville, California where both Nelson's and my photographs were posted in our mutual manager's display. I saw that on the web recently, and here was this stat, uh, sculpture of Nelson and right over his head. I thought, oh, I know her. This is me. <laughs> Cheryl. Now, the surprise guest is another longtime friend. I won't I can't tell you how many decades we've known each other. It's embarrassing. Bob Rush. Bob and I have been friends for many, many years, uh, for decades, actually, since our college days. He's a native Californian and graduated from North Hollywood High School and USC. Bob taught math and science in the Burbank schools for 31 years. His connections to Jeanette and Nelson are multitudinous. Are you sitting down? Yes, you are. His father coordinated the recordings for RCA and Columbia Records. His mother dated Nelson when both were at MGM. Nelson introduced his parents. Bob's father was Nelson's manager for 22 years. Bob is Nelson's godchild, and he is named for Nelson and Bobby Armbruster. 
the musical prodigy who led the orchestra in many of Nelson's radio shows and recordings. This gentleman's full name is Robert Nelson Rush. Uh, despite all these connections, none of us ever met or spent time with Nelson or Jeanette, although some of our parents, including mine, did. Okay. Now, where did I come from other than Mars? Uh, <laughs> Uh, I was born in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. Lovely name, three words. It means bottom of the lake. <laughs> now, what on earth draws someone from the bottom of the lake to come to the surface and come out here? I saw a movie in afternoon kindergarten, and it was going across the desert. There were jackrabbits. And where did it end up? Here. And I said to my teacher, I, Mommy, Daddy, that's where I'm moving. And then when I was about nine, I thought, just like my dad, who had been here during the war before he went overseas, I better learn Los Angeles if I'm going. So I started writing the Automobile Club of Southern California. And every realtor I knew, I was nine. And uh, to find uh, where to best put my ranch, where I could have my horses and my Jeep. <laughs> and also maps of the freeways. And that long ago, there were five major freeways. So I memorized them in the off-ramps that existed. And I knew all along I was going to come out here, which I eventually did. Now, why Wisconsin? What is unique about there and wanting to come here? I just want to read you something. I was involved in a campaign in Wisconsin to build a, a performing arts center. And we started coming up with famous Wisconsinites. Many of them were tied to Jeanette Nelson. So let me just give you a, a sample of who's from where I'm from. It's quite amazing. Um, I'm not, but they are. Spencer Tracy. Both he and Harrison Ford went to Ripon College about half an hour from my hometown. Spencer, who was in movies with Jeanette, is from Milwaukee. Frederick March, El Giro. Liberace and his violin playing brother George. Witty Herman, clarinetist, who went to school with my father, Daniel J. Trevanti, Alfred Lunt and Lynn Fontaine. And you know, they knew Nelson and Jeanette very well. The Doyens of the American Theater. Their home was the lovely Ten Chimneys Estate in Genesee Depot, Wisconsin. He was born in Milwaukee. Get this, Herbert Stoddard. The in-house MGM composer who scored Naughty Marietta, Rosemarie, Maytime, Sweethearts, The Chocolate Soldier, and The Wizard of Oz. It all started in Wisconsin. Les Paul, the famed guitar player who followed Nelson in recording and mixing multiple tracks on recordings. Pat O'Brien, Don Amici, Henry Winkler, Gene Wilder, Chris Farley, Orson Welles, Tyne Daly, Jackie Mason, Hattie McDaniel, remember her? She was in a movie with Jeanette from Gone with the Wind originally. Ellen Corby, who played Grandma in The Waltons. Gina Rowlands. Alan Ludden, the game show host and husband of Betty White. William Defoe, the famed artist Georgia O'Keeffe. Architect Frank Lloyd Wright. Get this one, Houdini. <laughs> uh, and then there are a lot of news people, uh, Tom Snyder from Jerry Dunphy, who used to be out here on Channel 2, uh, Nancy Dickerson, playwright and novelist Thornton Wilder, Laura Ingalls Wilder, the author of Little House on the Prairie, which sort of is all about Wisconsin. Not the part I grew up in. We have toilets. <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> Did you know that Oprah Winfrey was raised in Milwaukee? And that Arnold Schwarzenegger went to college and got his degree from a branch of the University of Wisconsin. Just one quick final thing about Wisconsin Connections before I go back to our main subjects. One of the most famous people in the world who grew up in Wisconsin was Golda Meir, who later became Prime Minister of Israel. She was born in Kiev, Ukraine. But due to anti-Semitism, her family left and immigrated to Wisconsin when she was a young child. There she grew up, went to school, and became a teacher. To earn money for college, she worked at a department store called Schuster's, where my grandfather was her boss. In those days, she was known as Goldie Meyer. She moved to Palestine, now Israel, in 1921, 
to continue her work in the Zionist movement. So you see, I wasn't the first to see a movie and see jackrabbits alongside the Santa Fe super chief and want to come here. They're all my predecessors. So it's great to be with you and talk about this. Um, my mom and dad, before they married in the late 30s, saw Nelson and Jeanette at a wonderful concert with about 12,000 people, an outdoor concert in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. They had front row center seats and they were involved in things with classical music and so on and met them at a reception following. So I heard about these people all of my life. My, yes. Jeanette was there at Nelson's concert. That's what my parents said. I think it was a surprise visit. And there was a picture my mother has referred to showing Nelson and Jeanette on stage, my parents and my dad's brother and wife in the front row and in the shadows, Bob Rush's dad. Because when she met Bob Rush's dad, she said, Art to Art Rush, were you in Milwaukee and standing off stage? And this was on, I think it was like Life Magazine or Post or something. And they put this picture up, said, yes. And we broke all the records and so on and so on. And what year? I don't know. And I'm hunting for the picture. Mother thought it got lost in moving somewhere. But my grandparents had their recordings, uh, my parents did, and I was, my parents had me when they were older, mom was 38. And uh, by the way, her name was Jeanette, yeah. Anne, <laughs> spelled the way Jeanette spelled hers originally. They were about two years apart in age, so it must have been a popular name back in the early part of the century. Um, and I also listen to the radio programs because these things were among my parents' favorites. So I heard these things and they're not strange distance and songs or something I've just discovered. I heard Shorten and Bread and all of those things. And I still have the 78s. I mean, stacks of these things. I mean, you want a collection. Bob knows and so does Cheryl, they visited my house. Oi, <laughs> something. Um, there are some other interesting Wisconsin connections. You know from reading Sharon's book and, and the one that followed, the Irving Stone letters, that she went with a man named Irving Stone. Irving Stone was the heir to the Boston Star fortune. Boston Star was, until very recently, a big, successful chain, not unlike Bullock's Wilshire or Bullock's uh, Sherman Oaks of that era and, and quality. And he was the heir apparent, and she went with him for two years. She was in New York. This is before she ever went out west. And she'd come up to Milwaukee, Wisconsin all the time from Chicago and be in the area when she did concerts. I never met Irving Stone, but he has two nephews whom I know, and one of my classmates married one of them. And they're so rich that when they got married, each one was given a bank, and they now have... <laughs> They now have, I mean, you know, they've got banks, islands, all this, and they have big, beautiful dairy farms right where I go by, I go for fish on Friday nights in Wisconsin, right outside of my hometown. Yeah. And my brother did the advertising and an upgrade for one of their banks. So we know them. Yeah. Small world. Yeah. Um, and I know after all these years, because of my connections, I was probably around Jeanette and Nelson a lot. And Cheryl probably was, Bob, but I never met them. It was just like this, you know, and I was always working in, in television or radio and uh, covering stories. I was also going to school at the same time. And then to finish out my life, I joined the Naval Reserve. So I had four years of that. So I was a busy child, girl, older person. Now I'm really old. Um, when, uh, now, when Nelson and Jeanette uh, were to marry, uh, they built a house at one point on Halvern, and you've all visited and seen it, I believe. Eventually, it was sold to a man named Fred McMurray. We all know who he is. And Phyllis Diller lived across the street. Fred McMurray grew up about 45 minutes from where I did in Wisconsin. And every summer, McMurray and his wife, June Haver, would come from that house that had been Nelson's, to Beaver Dam, Wisconsin for the summer. And then the owners, the McKinstries, would go back out and be in the house with their kids for the summer. And the McKinstries from Beaver Dam are best friends of 
my relatives. And this was going back. I mean, I'm just learning all this recently. So there's another connection. Um, in my work, I met lots of people, as you can imagine, all over the world. I'm a reporter, anchor, all that stuff. And uh, I would never, ever have had any success here if it had not been for a wonderful man named Art Rush, who is Bob's, was Bob's father. And he had worked as at RCA, had great connections at NBC, and opened the doors for me with his connections to NBC, where I finally went and got hired. And uh, I was very young, and I got in there, and I was, in those days, the only woman news writer, then the only woman producer, then the only woman reporter. Then they put me in charge of a bureau. Years later, I was the company's first assistant news director in the own stations. But it all started with Art Rush. And uh, he's gone now, but and just wonderful, wonderful family. And we've been friends forever, as I have been with Cheryl. I met her parents, Roy and Dale, when I was 14 years old, and I met our rush when I was 17 in Wisconsin. And all in art said to me, Bob, I think you know this story. Uh, just remember, if you decide to come to California, go to USC, want to work in television, just remember, I'm no farther away than the phone. And I know he lived to regret it. And he once told me, remember when you met me, I had dark hair, nice wavy dark hair. See this white hair? You. <laughs> That's great. He's not the only one who said that. Now, um, so I have this connection to Arash, who is, was an amazing person, and he eventually became my manager, as he was for Nelson. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Art and his family. We wouldn't have had recorded programs on radio which in the 30s and 40s is like, was like television is now, if it weren't for art. He was a young employee at RCA and then later Columbia Artist Management. And he saw the studios throwing away all these machines uh, which were used to record sound on films. SOF, sound on films. And they were throwing them away because it had gone from discs to optical tracks on the side of the film itself. And they were just like, well, throw these away. And all the records were 78s. One song, and if you wanted a lot of songs, you, got, you bought a lot of 78s. And he thought, jeepers, these radio shows are beautiful, but they're gone forever. You hear it once and that's it. Why can't we record all the radio shows and replay them, syndicate them, whatever. So he made some calls. RCA had him come by train to the East Coast. He came back at 25, a vice president of RCA. He's the guy, Bob's dad, who invented recorded radio programs. Wouldn't have happened without him. And, and, and when he was at RCA, he was in charge of recording and supervising recordings of all these people. Nelson Eddy, Jeanette McDonald, Dinah Shore, uh, Leopold Stokowski, uh, Toscanini and the NBC Symphony Orchestra. Sharon's grandfather was in that orchestra. I mean, it just goes on and on. Jackie Gleason, uh, uh, Lily Pons, Nelson and Jeanette, later Roy and Dale. Uh, fa a fabulous career. And he was first at RCA and then went over to Columbia Artist Management, where he was responsible for, get this, 300 artists. 300. 33 of them were on radio at the same time. And he and Nelson had become, by this time, really, really close friends. So this is just amazing. And I now realize that because I knew a lot of these people, I ate at the same restaurants they knew, which were the ones Nelson and Jeanette like, shopped at the same stores, the whole thing. That's amazing. Now, Cheryl and Bob, Cheryl Rogers, Bob Rush, grew up in an environment totally unlike life in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, where the exciting thing was uh, <laughs> fishing <laughs> for whitefish. Uh, Ice skating in the winter, uh, pushing your brother down 
<laughs> in the snow. But I mean, it wasn't like here. I mean, they had famous people in and out of their houses all the time. Uh, Art Rush also discovered Mario Lanza, and Bob recalls Mario coming in the house, right? Singing, and his mother, who is a concert pianist, accompanying him. And, or Roy and Dale dropping by or needing to rehearse, and she would accompany them. And they belonged to the golf club over here, Lakeside, which had an annual show, and Bob's mother would accompany them. And uh, so one day, Bob told me a story about the family dog running in and hearing this beautiful woman singing and running right through the screen door and jumping in the pool. The woman was Dolores Hope, Bob's, Bob's wife. Yeah. And <laughs> so this was their normal life. And for Cheryl, it was going on the movie sets or sitting on Trigger, all those things, right? All those years. And it was just, and you've, many of you have gotten a chance to talk with her, so you know these things. Um, I got to know the Rushes and the Rogers so well that we would spend my birthdays or Christmases or Thanksgivings together. And we're all still wonderful friends. And I am so blessed to have that happen and know that these are just among the kindest, nicest people in the world. And they all have connections to Nelson and Jeanette. Uh, Cheryl's mom, Dale Evans, in 1940, was introduced on Command Performance, the radio show for the troops, uh, by Jeanette McDonald, and Dale did two songs on that. Um, when Art Rush, Bob's dad, left, Columbia Artists in 1939 and formed his own agency. His first client and dear friend was Nelson Eddy. And he wanted someone with competing talent, not an opera star, something totally different. And so he went to a restaurant called Dupar's, which used to be on Ventura Boulevard in Studio City. And he met someone who was making, what, $75 a week or something way back then? No agent, yeah. So he was making hardly anything. And this nice young man came over and they sat down to eat at Dupar's and talk about it. And the nice young man said, well, you know, I don't know about you representing me. You've got all these fancy people like Stacy Waski, Munstokowski, et cetera. And, and then this nice young man said, where are you from? And Art said, Ohio. He said, so am I. He put his hand across the table and shook hands and said, okay, Buckeye, Buck, you know, the Buckeye State, Buck, we'll do it. That was Roy Rogers. They were both from Ohio. And that's how it started. And all their lives, their contract to both of their deaths, nothing signed. It was that handshake at Dupar's, which is sort of an amazing story and also a credit to both of them for their trust in each other. Uh, the same thing happened with Nelson. Uh, Art became Nelson's manager for 22 years, right, Bob, I believe? Um, in addition, there's another man in Nelson's life uh, who was his business manager, did his taxes and so on, and became mine, and, and did Bob's and Roy's and Dale's, Jim Osborne in Beverly Hills, and he was in a building at 357 North Cannon Drive, built in 1947. Who built it? Who owned it? Nelson, who had his office there? Nelson. And so I was reading some things Sharon had in some of her books, and I was reading Nelson's will. And people were sort of wondering, what are these initials and so on? And I said, oh, I said to Sharon, oh, I know all about this. And there were these initials, E-H, that meant Esther Harder. Who's Esther Harder? She was ran Jim's office. Who is, you know, I'm not swearing, her initials were BS. <laughs> Bernie Sennard, that was Esther's sister. And, and she initialed, you know, notarized Nelson's will, which is the one that went all the way to the very end. And I remember meeting Jim and he said one day, and I knew I'd been late with taxes, so I thought, you got to be nice to your tax man so he helps you. So I always made him brownies. <laughs> so I went in with brownies, and Jim got this little smile. And I uh, said, I'm going to introduce you to some people here. You've got some things in common. I said, Esther, tell Ann where you're from. She says, Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, and so is my sister. We're from the same place. Yeah. So 
those people were in my life as well. Um, okay. I made crib notes because there's so much of this. Now, over there, you see some pictures that we've posted. And uh, let me walk around you here. I better, I better go that way. Okay, excuse me. It is. She says. Yeah, I'm just moving over here. Okay. Um, this is sort of an interesting collection. Um, you know, Nelson and Jeanette's life was sort of rocky at different points, and they go together, not go together, whatever. And. MGM was the big studio. Well, Bob's mom had been on Broadway, and she was on Broadway with Fred and Adele Astaire, and she was Adele's understudy. One year, she had parts in 10 Broadway shows. She was from West Virginia, a child prodigy who was her church's organist when she was 13 years old. Her name was Mary Jo Matthews. Her father was a pharmacist. She was one of two children graduated from West Virginia University with a degree in education, later studied music at UCLA, but had gone to Broadway and uh, then went on the road with these troops. And at one point, they were in my hometown in Wisconsin, like 1929 or something. And uh, Adele Astaire got sick and Mary Jo Matthews replaced her. Who was in the audience? My mother. So she told her this story many, many years later. So when Nelson, you know, would, and Jeanette would sort of be apart, he would date other women. Uh, this is one he dated, Mary Jo Matthews, Bob's mother, right there. And this is another actress there. They are greeting him coming back from his successful tour for Naughty Marietta. So there is Mary Jo Matthews now. And there she is with her husband later, Art Rush. Nelson introduced, uh, Nelson introduced Mary Jo to Art Rush, his good friend who later became his manager. And they were married in Yuma, Arizona. And nine months and like three weeks later, they had Bob's older brother, Bill, who became a jet fighter pilot in the Air Force and later a very successful surgeon. And sadly, he just died a few weeks ago at age 86. Uh, Brilliant fellow, very, very talented. Um, he uh, was also a wonderful artist. His medical drawings are still in some of the top textbooks in the world, and I guess that's a real specialized thing. And uh, I don't know if many of you know this, but there's a whole uh, Gilbert and Sullivan group up in San Jose, one of the best in the country. When they realized they had someone who liked Gilbert and Sullivan and could sew because he was a surgeon, they contacted Bill. And I remember one time visiting he and his family up in uh, Los Gatos, and Bill showed me his latest costumes from Gilbert and Sullivan. So it was fun. <laughs> He's a good guy. Um, anyway, so I brought these pictures from, from the past. So there's a very show, Bob's mom and Nelson, and then older pictures of them and Christmas at the Rushes because we would be there, older picture of them. And then this one, you can, some of you have seen this, the Rush family, including Bill, the one who became a doctor, and Bob at about, what, seven or eight, something like that. And, uh, and then the connections with Cheryl, Royal, and Roy and Dale, uh, Dale in the pool being pulled in by a German shepherd. <laughs> and then you may wonder what's over here. Now, these are some special things. Um, these were given by Nelson Eddy to the Russians. I don't know who she is, but here, you know, Nelson was famous for his nude torsos or full bodies. This is one of them, of a woman, and uh, we don't know who it is, right? But no, and this was a gift to his father from Nelson, okay? And then in 1941, Nelson, who was such a great sculptor, did one of his manager, Art Rush, which is this one, a solid bronze. And on the side, N period, E period, 1941. And I know from Sharon's books reading that Nelson collected 
pewter and liked it, and also Tang, T-A-N-G, sculpture from China, uh, and, and art and antiques from China, which are very, very, very valuable. Also, that he gave fabulous gifts to his friends. The Russians were given a buffet, and it was like, for those of you who know a lot about furniture, it, to me it looked like Henrodon or Heritage. This stuff's fifteen to $25,000 a piece. It's now with Bill Rush's family up in Eureka, California. Um, Bob has this, which came from Nelson as a Christmas gift, uh, a little wagon. Ancient, this could be a couple, almost a couple thousand years old, Tang sculpture. These are worth a bloody fortune, so we're guarding it. But that, and you put a candle here, and that was a Christmas gift to the Rushes uh, from Nelson also. And uh, they were all very, very close um, and, and, and dear, dear friends. So I invite you, you know, later, if you haven't looked at these things, uh, to look at them as well. I have to get this here. Just a minute. We need radio mics. <laughs> okay. Um, Bob never met Nelson, though, and, and nor did Cheryl, but their parents uh, knew Nelson and knew Jeanette uh, very, very well. Um, when Nelson died, his funeral was much smaller than Jeanette's. And Sharon has former news film of that. And we will stop it and show you uh, who is there uh, at this. And let me move out of the way a second. And we'll stop. Ugh. Hold on. Thing isn't too sturdy here. I've got it. All right. So this is on YouTube. And freeze it, yeah. And what's interesting, I'll point out where Bob's dad is, where Jim Osborne is, and those are the, among the pallbearers. And then right behind the pallbearers, Art that day said, I've got to be there so early that um, I, I don't want to take your mom there and have her be there for two or three hours. Bob, can you take her to, to the funeral? And Bob had been in the Coast Guard on active duty and had just gotten out. So the next people you'll see are Bob and his mom, Mary Jo. Okay. Okay. I might have to back up here so I can see it without it. I'm sorry I'm in your way. Eh, maybe I'll get out of your... No, that's... Well, I could sit right here and you wouldn't have to look at my head. Okay. My horns. Okay. This is outside. And this is Hollywood Memorial, I believe. <laughs> Can you all see this? Okay. Oh. His? <laughs> no. <laughs> I just didn't put an X. No, I shouldn't say this. They, we use the term butt splice. They ran a lot of these together. So you go backwards and forwards on this stuff. In news film, it's from different sources. It was called Hollywood Memorial, but now it's Hollywood Forever, well, right? Because she has the mic. That's why she's going to tell the list. Yeah. 
this is sort of right behind the old RKO KHJ studio. And for those of you who know it, near the good Mexican food at Lucy's El Adobe. Onlookers, funeral attendant. Funeral attendant. He looks like a cadaver. No, I shouldn't say. <laughs> I think it's next. Okay. Bob, there's your Volkswagen. Okay. Where? Keep going. Keep yeah. Sharon, And Jeanette was only 61. It's interesting. He had a stroke on stage while he was singing yeah. in Miami, never regained consciousness. And earlier that day, he told a reporter who said, are you going to retire? He said, no, I'm going to sing till I drop. And that night he did. There's Bob's Volkswagen, 1960. Okay. No, we keep going. Yeah. Okay. That's why I knew when I saw this video on YouTube that Bob Rush was at this service. <laughs> Oh, I had the same one, same color. Okay, they're coming out. They're coming out. Just a minute. Okay. Freeze it. Please. Okay. Now, this is Bob's dad, Art Rush, walking right here. He's real tall. He's about 6'2", right there. And that's where he knew, before he really knew me well, he still had darker hair. It changed, though, you know, it became like the... Anyway, that's, that's Art. And then, uh, let's go a little forward. Right behind him is Jim Osborne. Sort of sandy hair slicked way back. Not real tall. Bob, you can see it, right? There's, there's art right there in the foreground. That's Lloyd Nolan. Oh, just a minute. There's Jim. Stop. Back, back up. Can you back up a second? Or not? I, why? Is this him right here? No, just behind. Back up a couple seconds. Okay. There's Art Rush yeah. with a boutonniere, real tall. Lloyd Nolan. Stop. That, see the guy, now his hair is white? Yeah, another person I gave white hair. My accountant, Jim Osborne, right there. The, not real tall, right there. They knew everything about everything, right. They continue. And I'll tell you when to freeze it next. Now, right after the Paul Bears... Come a couple of people, you're gonna know just a bit. Meredith Wilson. Meredith Wilson on the right. Now, stop. Okay, here's Bob at about 23. It, it'll show you, and there's his mother, Mary Jo, Mary Jo Matthews Rush, right there. Right here on the left is Mary Jo. Right here. And right there is Bob. 
Yeah, you can you slow mo it a little? Uh, no. Okay. Can you see them as they walk further though? Yeah, and then they'll be standing on the side. Okay. There they are. There they are, there walking they are. over. Wow. And now stop just a minute. They're still, they're over there, but it's hard to see them. Look, run it a little more, if you could, please. That's it. That's enough. No? Yeah. We don't, no. No, we don't have to see the rest of these people. Okay. Now, no, I, we're done with the video. But I must say, after Nelson's death, after Nelson's death, uh, his widow Anne wrote a letter to Art Rush and uh, thanking him for his years of help and friendship with Nelson and giving him Nelson's uh, silver hairbrush and mirror and also white cotton gloves he wore in one of his movies. And I remember Nelson's white hair still in the brush when I saw it many, many years ago. Unfortunately, over the years, those items disintegrated and are, are no more. Now, I have a couple of other quick stories, very quick, hope they're humorous, related to Nelson and his family and Jeanette. Years ago, when I was a reporter in New York, uh, I covered all, all sorts of things. And one day I was sent to interview a famous old actor who had written his autobiography. He was French. His name was Marie Chevalier. And we lighted up a New York bookstore. It looked like MGM and did this thing. And he was, oh, this is lovely. And so I went to interview him and my story was on the 10 o'clock news. And he was so nice and so gracious. And we had a great time talking and did this feature on him, included some things from his films. Later that day, my mother flies in from Paris. My mother, Jeanette Ann. And mother loved New York. She wished I'd lived there all the time rather than here. Adored it. So mom, the next morning, Saturday morning, said, um, Jay, let's go out. I want to be in the city. I love it here. So 10 o'clock in the morning, we're walking up Madison Avenue by F.R. Tripler and on the way to Brooks Brothers, that area. And, and walking up, I lived over by the UN on East 46th Street. And suddenly mother said, look, look. And this man with white hair, not real tall, arms wide, smiling. Anne, Anne Claire. Ah, it's Marie Chevalier. And so Marie Chevalier comes up to us. It was lovely. Thank you so much. It was a wonderful story you did and so on. And who is this lovely lady? I said, this is my mother, Jeanette. <laughs> and he says, oh, I worked with someone named Jeanette. And he takes my mother's hand, goes, Jeanne, like this. And my mother, who's really old and had white hair, uh, is just like, oh, thank you, you know, and blah, blah, blah. Where, where Do you live here? No, I just flew in from Paris. Oh, Paris, Jeanne, oh. I should show you Paris and so on. Anyway, but he goes on and on and says, I worked with someone named Jeanette. It was just wonderful. And of course, we knew who it was. And I have one other quick story. And then we can throw it up into questions or you may ask my, my guest questions. This story <laughs> relates to someone uh, we've heard a lot about. You know, for those of you who live in California, it gets hot, it gets windy. And somehow, even though the walls are tight and the windows are closed, you get a house full of sand. And I traveled so much. My, my job took 70, 80 hours. I might be gone two months. I'd wake up in the morning. I didn't know if I'd be in Manila or Amman, Jordan or wherever. So I always had a cleaning lady, but I didn't live in a big place. So the apartments. So I had a cleaning lady like a half day every other week. And my cleaning lady, Essie, moved up to Sacramento. So I was sort of desperate. And I asked my next door neighbor, who was an actress, who was Angela Lansbury's understudy. She said, oh, I just got a great lady from Angela, Hortense. I said, well, can you arrange for Hortense to come see me and we'll try her out. So Hortense comes over 
and she's nearly done. She said, what do you think? What do you think? I said, it's great. She said, before I go, I have to have, introduce you to another of my ladies. Can you believe it? I have two ladies I work for now, and both of them are named Anne. And I'm like, oh, okay. She says, let me call her. I said, Ann what? She says, Ann Eddie. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> now I didn't know all the good stuff, but I mean, I didn't want to talk to Ann Eddie. She says, oh, no, no problem. She'll be glad to talk. You know, she's lonely life. Her husband died, blah, blah, blah. So she gets on my phone and says, here, Mrs. Eddie, I have someone to talk to you. You have something in common. And so I said, hello, this is Ann Kessner. Oh, yes. Now, she was from Denver, right, originally? My nephew lives there. You talk like you're from the West, like, hello, how are you? You know, real mellow. She's like, ooh, ooh, like this. And so I said, oh, Mrs. Eddie, hello, this is Ann Kessner. She said, oh, I knew, I knew you. I've seen you on television and blah, 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 blah. I said, oh, that, you know, good. I said, we have, we have some people we know in common. She says, oh, who? Yeah. <laughs> so I say, well, for starters, Art Rush. Oh, yes. And then Jim Osborne. Oh, of course. You know, <laughs> I'm like, okay. And I'm just like, well, it's been nice to talk to you. And I've got to get back to our cleaning now. Bye. So that's my connection to Aunt Eddie. <laughs> Only in Hollyweird. <laughs> Any questions or anything from anybody? I have one thing Bob would like me to do before I... Say, but if you have questions first. Anybody with any questions about anything? Yeah, okay. Um, I love the, I love the Aunt Eddie story, though. Now... Bob Rush is, wants to make sure some things find a good home. And he asked me if I would make this presentation. So there are two things over here that he would like to give to Sharon and Mac Eddy for perpetuity. And these are the sculptures done by Nelson and given to his family. The, the female torso, which is over there, and, and the bronze of his dad on the side, N period, E period, 1941, because he knows they would go on and have meaning and have a good home with Sharon and all of you. Oh, hi, Dolly. Thank you so much. Wow, I didn't expect that. Wow. Wow. I won't cry. Thank you, Anne. And thank you, all the guests uh, that came with her. Thank you. I realize I had one last thing that we forgot to do, and so we'll do it for the ending, and that's to get our, our three gals who went up to Lake Tahoe and to see what it looked like quickly. Um, just a quick presentation of what happened. So why don't you girls come up? I'm going to show a few stills that they took while they're up there, and then we will wrap up. Okay, so the first one was Kalinian. Kalinian. Kalinian Bay. Carnelian. Were, were they saying just for you? Yeah. This is in front of the... Blue Aguave West Restaurant, which is closed now, two of the uh, totem poles that are left. As far as I know, yes, that's what I was told. That's crazy. Okay, this is that's the Log Lodge, where apparently they did part of the um, filth retakes. Right. We were uh, within walking distance of the lodge. Yeah, because they filmed in a log cabin up up the mountain, and then when they had the three takes, they came down and did it. And, and people can go there and stay. It's like a Two years ago when I was here, I looked it up, and it was an Airbnb then. That's a picture of the Airbnb we were at, which was about a half a block away. And the uh, little pictures are at the... Museum. Gatekeeper. The Gatekeeper Museum, correct. 
a memento. And then she said, the lady said she just got a uh, disc of uh, rosemary and that she hadn't put it into the uh, television yet. And here's that's the uh, the theater, the Capitol, yeah. and Truckee. Yeah, they were filming here. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Upstairs was the movie theater, and downstairs was the saloon. And supposedly, they also threw popcorn. He threw popcorn at the screen because they if they screened Naughty Marietta, and he was moving it forward. And this thing down here is what it is now inside. Is that yes. What that is. Right. Yes, it's a ladies' clothing store. Oh, okay. Let's see. Okay. I had a question. Why? Why are you with Bonifaz there? It's a joke. It's a joke. <laughs> Somebody had to be something else. Okay. Because we said it. It's a bad shit. Okay. Okay. And here is Chambers, Chambers Landing. Chambers Landing. The lodge was far down years ago. But that's where it was. This is Five Lakes Trail where you're going up to, as I call it, my rock and tree. <laughs> okay. And here, I, I love the sign that says no. Uh, um, it's closed. It's closed. The trail is closed. It's not stop. It's stop at all. There was still and snow up there, there and snow. at the Five Lakes, there's still ice. And the trail past where the tree and the rock is is covered in snow still, and the trails are closed. And that's our little uh, Tahoe grizzly bear that we saw on, alongside the road. Oh, not a they call it a. It's a black bear, but they call it a Tahoe grizzly because of the long blonde hair. Who was it? Yes, you can see why the trail was. Yeah, the trail was completely washed out. Not like it was two years ago. Okay, explain. Oh, she can't talk about it. No. It's, her, it's her tree. Watch your feet there. This is the only tree that, this is the only tr uh, tree that we thought could be the, the tree. And uh, there, the rock, there's no rock there, but if you, I had a hiking stick, and if I poked down, we could feel rock up under there. We did pull some bark off the tree, if you want to see some of the bark. Leslie has a giant, hold it up, Leslie, a gigantic piece, because it's her tree. Her tree. It's going home with me. <laughs> <laughs> Do or die. This is all of us hugging at the tree, isn't it? I think that's what that was. Yeah. And it's kind of a sentimental. And Kelly took our picture. See from underneath the tree. Yeah. When I sing love call. Oh, where they sing Indian love call. Well, it's it's a split tree. Oh. If you look at the photos, the still photos, it is a split tree, and that's the only one they found in in that location there. That's a section. But it's kind of cut down. Like that. So well, you know, it's eighty eight. So we're at eighty eight years ago. They did that. Yeah. There they are. And we kind of looked at the background too, or Leslie did. Yeah, and basically, they're standing behind that stone. And they're standing on the rock. Where the rock would have been. And there's this, that is back there. My mom and I think there was the more tree. But it was half dead, wasn't it? Yeah. And you see the snow on the mountains yet. Yes. And we hiked over snow going up. It was cold. There, we just end with that. Yes. If you want to show them the what you brought. Oh, just there. Is, yeah, yeah. Where's my stick? Which one? What do you want? Hand me, hand me my stick, my little stick. What? Yeah, that. Here. We were looking for the rock where Nelson first sang uh, Indian Love Call to Jeanette, and we had the beans and bacon. By the way, we did have beans and bacon up there, too. Um, and I was saying, Nelson Jeanette, show us where, you know, you're, I was just kind of kidding. I went to a rock and a, and a tree where I thought it might be. I thought this cool piece of wood and picked it up. And then right on there, you probably can't see it. There's a little heart <laughs> in the wood. I said, okay, that's it. That's it. <laughs> so it'll be up here if you want to see it. Um, Anything else from you? The tree. This is Sam from uh, Long Camp Richardson. So we made a. Sex in the beach drink. 
walked along the beach, got paid for it, just thinking that maybe Jeanette Nelson had been there and we had our drink that hung the beach. And, and, and partially, sand. it has peach schnapps in it. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Chris, for sharing that. And uh, with that, we'll wrap up the afternoon. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. I hope it was informative and fun. And we will see you next time.